I want to welcome you all here. Um, also introduce myself. My name is Adam. I'm the pastor here. What a privilege it is. Uh, if you're new this morning to have you here worshiping with us, we are uh, currently in a series entitled Low Hanging Fruit, and we're looking at the fruit of the Spirit found in Galatians chapter 5. And we've kind of been saying, we've been reading this definition every single week, low hanging fruit, and I'm not going to read it this week, but low hanging fruit is this it's the thing that is easily obtainable. It's easily obtainable. But Galatians 5, right before we read the fruit of the Spirit, it talks about the battle between the flesh and the spirit. Now, the fruit of the spirit is easy. It's the things we should be going after. It's easily obtainable, but how many know it's really difficult? Let's just be real for a moment here. It's really difficult to walk in the fruit of the spirit when you're driving down Blanding Boulevard and your patience is wearing thin, right? Or maybe your, your in-laws are living with you. Like, come on, Jesus, like I need your help right now. Or maybe there's something tragic or traumatic that happened in your life or Maybe that's the in-laws moving in with you. I'm just joking with you. <laughs> just joking. Um, it's hard and difficult to walk in the fruit of the Spirit and to listen to the Spirit uh, in those moments, in those times. And, man, we love, I love my in-laws. I'm so thankful for them. They're such good people. Uh, but it's hard in those moments sometimes that where someone tests you, really tests you, uh, to walk in the fruit of the Spirit. But, man, when we listen to the Spirit of God that lives within us, then these fruits should be easy to walk in. It's a matter of that battle that's going on every single day. But another thing that we face a lot is this, that as Christians, a lot of times what we'll do is we'll fix our eyes on the complexities of walking in the gifts of the Spirit, right? Prophecy, the gift of wisdom, the gift of giving and making money and giving back to the... But we'll We'll focus on those things. There's nine gifts. We'll be covering them in a future series next year. And we'll fix our eyes on that versus fixing our eyes on the giver of every good and perfect gift. And it results in this shallow relationship with this loving father who has so much more for us. Yeah? And so what do we do? We fix our eyes on Jesus. As we fix our eyes on Jesus, then we'll naturally be able to walk in these gifts and in the fruit of the Spirit that God has for us. Let's read uh, Galatians chapter 5. We've been reading it uh, every, single, every single week. And so by now, you've, you probably have this down in your spirit, I, I pray. Galatians 5, 22, it says this, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, Gentleness, say gentleness. That's what we're talking about this morning. Self-control. Against such there is no law. And those who are Christ have been crucified with the flesh, with its passions and desires. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another or envying one another. So let's talk about this fruit of gentleness, which is so easily obtainable when we Decide not to listen to our flesh, but to what? Listen to the Spirit. Let's, uh, let's pray this morning. Let's invite the Holy Spirit to speak. Holy Spirit, we're, we're here for you. We're here for you this morning and you alone, Jesus. Lord, in this room right now, we simply want to hear exactly, God, what you have for us. So, Holy Spirit, I pray that you would speak to each and every single individual, God, or what you have for them this morning. Jesus, I pray for the fruit of gentleness to be activated and working in our life in those moments where we want to listen to our flesh. God, we would resist those moments. And Lord, we would listen to your spirit. In all that we do, God, in every moment, in every single season, Jesus, we want to listen to the fruit, God, of your spirit which is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Father, would you help us to walk in that and to be that to this world because the world is watching Jesus and you're calling your people to walk in that. Well, we thank you. We love you. We're here to receive from you this morning. So open our ears to hear that your word be a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. In Jesus' mighty name, amen, amen. When I was uh, 12 years old, I remember the first time that I ever got in a fight, and it was the one and only time I ever got in a legitimate fight. 
Now I was uh, actually the same height that I am now. So I was about six foot and I was 12. So imagine I was a lot bigger than most other 12 year olds, but I was also a buck 35. So, you know, you can kind of think I'm like skin and bones, but I'm a lot taller than most people. And uh, I kind of had a little bit of a, let me be honest with you, at moments I walked in a little bit of arrogance and pride because uh, I love sports, and sports came easy to me as a kid. So I was big into the baseball and, and basketball and football, but all my other buddies who were in the neighborhood, I lived in a neighborhood where everybody kind of got together and hung out and stuff. Everybody else in the neighborhood, though, they were into more extreme sports. And so I remember walking over a friend's house, and uh, they were doing back in the day, you remember rollerblading, like grinding down uh, poles and stuff and, and skateboarding. Maybe kids still do it today. I, I don't know. And, but they were doing this. And, of course, the fashion statement back then that all my buddies were wearing were these big, huge Jinkos. You all remember that? The, it, it was the ugliest thing that if you wore them, I'm sorry. Like, I'm not, I'm not trying to. But we got to admit, it wasn't the best-looking uh, fashion statement, but everybody wore these Jinkos that I was around, and they were they were skating, and and I, I made a, a an arrogant, prideful comment in the moment, and said something along the lines of, "I mean, you guys should play like a real sport sometime instead of this grinding, right?" And uh, the next thing I know is that a friend of mine took off the rollerblade. I'm 12. They threw the rollerblade at me. It missed me, and the next thing I know is he's attacking me. Remember, he's smaller than I am. I'm 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 a six foot. A 12-year-old. Like, I haven't grown an inch since. And uh, so next thing I know, I'm, I'm next to a tree, and I didn't know what to do. He's, just, he's running at me. So I grab him, and I throw him against a tree, and the, and the fight was over. <laughs> but the thing about this is, is in my spirit, I was already had a relationship with the Lord. In my spirit, I remember feeling like one of the first times ever this grief of the Holy Spirit and this conviction of the Holy Spirit, and I immediately regretted my arrogance and my pride. We've all said things at different moments and times to someone or to a particular situation that we walked in where we immediately regretted what we did. Maybe for you, you had your blinker on and you were in a parking lot and you're ready to turn into your parking spot, but someone at the last minute came and zoomed into your parking spot and you lost it, Right? And you went off on them. You immediately regretted <laughs> what you did, even though you felt like, hey, I had a right to do that. Or maybe you had a sharp tone with your spouse or your kids or something else along those lines, and you immediately felt regret. And that's really the Holy Spirit bringing that in that moment. You felt the conviction of the Holy Spirit. and In that moment, you had really three options. You could apologize, which none of us like to do. You could push down what you did on the side of you and just not approach it, not think about it anymore. Or you could even just defend. You could defend your wrongdoing and your arrogance and in your pride. And Paul, he writes to the church in Philippi, and he says this, that we're to do and how we're supposed to handle conflict in our lives. He says, let your gentleness be known to only people you like. No, didn't say that. Let your gentleness be known to only your family members. No. Or for some of you, only people who aren't your family members because you're rude to your family members. <laughs> we all have those moments, including myself. But what does he say? Let your gentleness be known to all men, to all people. Let your gentleness be known to all people. How hard is it sometimes to live this out? When you have been wronged and you still need to handle the situation with the fruit of gentleness and extend forgiveness towards someone, it's what Paul is saying for us to do here. What is he saying? Let your gentleness be known to all people. So what is gentleness? Let me give you a definition of gentleness now. Gentleness is kindness, consideration, a spirit of fairness and compassion. Gentleness is a fruit of the spirit that is fundamental to our relationships, especially those that can keep us on edge, right? This fruit is absolutely necessary in our lives. It's necessary when we're dealing with people who just know how to push our buttons. 
Maybe it's because of your own lack of self-control, though, or their lack of self-control. Or maybe something in their life is going on in the inside of them. Or maybe in your life, something's going on in the inside of you. But gentleness is not to be misunderstood. Gentleness is not weakness. The world will make you think that gentleness is weakness, that, hey, if you're gentle, man, you've got to stand up for what you believe and stand up for what, you're right, what is right. And to a certain level and degree, absolutely. We're going to talk about that in a moment. But gentleness should not be viewed as weakness. What is gentleness? It's inward strength. It's having an inward self-control despite your circumstances around you. Gentleness is balanced. It's disciplined. It's not being a coward or a pushover. That's not what gentleness is. I was um, talking with Pastor Eric uh, two weeks ago at the Thanksgiving pack out, and he was asking me two weeks ago, hey, what are you, what are you speaking on uh, this week? And I said, yeah, I'm speaking on faithfulness, and then the following week I'm speaking on gentleness, and I made a comment to him, I said, just kind of, kind of a little bit of it was true, I guess, but I said to him, you know, speaking on gentleness, maybe I should have found someone else to speak on gentleness because it, none of us want to talk about gentleness. I'm th- we think to ourselves, you know, I'm a guy, I'm not gentle, right? Or maybe, you know, I'm a boss babe, I'm not gentle. We reject this. But when you really think about Jesus, When you really think about who Jesus was, Jesus was gentle, yet at the same time, he was bold. He had bold like gentleness, and he had gentle like boldness. The thing about Jesus is he has incredibly complex, various personality and giftings and, uh, and character, right? And I was thinking about this. You know, I've been into music as an illustration. I've been into music for two decades. And I I began to play music when I was 16 years old and felt called into worship ministry and uh, loved the process and discovered early on I loved the process when I was 19, 20 of just recording and writing songs. And out of that love, I learned how to, you know, mix sound and stuff. And one thing about a sound is, you know, there's all these various different array of... um, of frequencies, right? So the bass drum kind of sits around 80 hertz uh, in a mix. Uh, the, the, the bass guitar will sit around 60 hertz, or, and then you kind of notch it up and leave room for the, the kick drum to kind of come through at that 80 hertz. So you notch it out 80 hertz and allow the bass drum to be 100 and kind of above. And then you have the lead guitar that's kind of in, uh, you know, one to three kilohertz typically, or a vocal that kind of sits in the, in the frequency in the range of, I'm telling you a lot of stuff that you're like, yeah, this doesn't matter, I'm about to get to the point here in a moment. Um, it, the vocals that sit around, you know, uh, one kilohertz all the way up to, uh, to 12 kilohertz, you're going to get an airy vocal sound around 16 kilohertz. But what I'm saying with this is this, that if you don't mix, if you don't notch everything out into the right and correct frequency, what it sounds like is this muddy mix. But once you have all these instruments that are offering different frequencies and you're able to really hone in on that frequency that really sounds good, you get this incredibly perfect mix and what you hear is beauty. Right, Kevin? Come on, Jesus, our sound guy back there. He does an amazing job. When every instrument is singing perfectly, it gives this perfect mix. Jesus had this perfect mix of gentleness and boldness. He had this perfect mix of who he was. And so to really understand gentleness, we need to understand the various uh, aspects of who Jesus is. You see, he is perfectly gentle and perfectly bold and victorious. And this is why we admire him. We admire him for his glory but even more because his glory is mingled in humility. We admire him for his uncompromising justice, but even more because it is tempered with mercy. We admire him for his majesty, but even more because it is a majesty in meekness. We admire him because of his sovereign dominion over the world, but even more because his dominion was clothed with a spirit of obedience and submission. We love the way he took on the proud scribes with his wisdom, and we love it even more because he could be simple enough to teach children and to spend time with them. 
We admire him because he could calm the storm, but even more because he refused to use that power to strike the Romans down with lightning when he hung on the cross and called the angels to take him down. He controlled the wind and the waves and all the weather. And he walked in humility, but yet he walked in boldness. Do you see what I mean when I say understanding Jesus is complex? Who he was, he has so many facets of his character, the many facets and various qualities of who Jesus is, is a perfect balance of diverse qualities. And that's what makes Jesus so incredibly perfect. So to really understand the fruit of gentleness, you have to understand the complexities of Jesus. One of the best way to do this is to answer this question, which we're going to be spending the remainder of our time doing. And the question is this, how can Jesus be both the lion, like we sing about in the second song this morning, how can he be both the lion and the lamb? Because a lion is bold and the lamb is gentle. Let's go to Revelation chapter 5 to answer this question. Let's read this together. So John is receiving a vision from the Lord. And he sees his vision of the throne room of heaven. He writes and he says this in verse 1. And I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne a scroll written inside and on the back, sealed with seven seals. Then I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, who is worthy to open the scroll and and loose its seals. And no one in heaven on earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or look at it. So John says, so I wept because no one was found worthy to open and read the scroll or to look at it. But one of the elders said to me, do not weep. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has prevailed to open the scroll and to loose its seven seals. And I looked and behold, in the midst of the throne, in the four living creatures, in the midst of the elders, stood a lamb as though he had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, with the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. Then he came and took the scroll out of the right hand of him who sat on the throne. Let's read now verse 5 again. Look, look, look at this. But one of the elders said to me, Do not weep, John. Do not weep. Behold, the lion of Judah. So Jesus here is described as a lion. What is a lion? A lion is an animal who makes prey of others. And who is strong and wild and majestic and dangerous. But then in verse 6, John is allowed to see this lion. And what he sees is a complete surprise to him. Because he saw a lion and now look what he sees. And I looked, and behold, the midst of the throne and the four living creatures in the midst of the elders stood a lamb as though it had been slain. So now this lion is now a lamb. A lamb is an animal that is easily preyed upon and that is weak and harmless and lowly. It's sheer for clothes and killed for food. It's a representation of gentleness, a lamb is. So I think that we can safely say that Jesus, he's a lamb-like lion and a lion-like lamb. In other words, we can say that Jesus has gentle-like boldness and bold-like gentleness. In the time and the season, in the culture that we live in today, don't we need that same attributes in our lives? Do we have gentle like boldness and bold like gentleness? The only way to do that is to listen to the Spirit of God. Not to listen to our flesh, but we listen to what? The Spirit of God. And we're able to walk in gentleness in this healthy way, the way Jesus did. Let me show you this now, and back to verse 5. But one of the elders said to me, Do not weep. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David... He has prevailed to open the scroll and loose its seals. There is only one person who can open the scroll. Only one person in his name is Jesus. He is the lion of the tribe of Judah. And the reason that he is worthy to open the scroll is that he has conquered. 
But what this is reconquering refer to. We can see that clearly in verse 9. Here the four living creatures and the 24 elders fall down and they worship the Lamb of God and they sang a new song and they said, You were worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals. For you were slain and have been redeemed by God, by your blood, out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation. So notice carefully here this. Notice carefully between verse 5 and verse 9. In verse 5, the reason why the line of the tribe of Judah is able to open the scroll is because he conquered. He had victory. But in verse 9, the reason why the line of the tribe of Judah was able to open the scroll because that same lion was slain. He was slain for our sin. He was slain for what we have done. He was slain for our wrongs. In other words, he was able to open the scroll because he was gentle like a lion and his slaughter was the victory referred to in verse 5. Jesus is gentle like a lion and what we love is he's victorious I'm sorry, he's gentle like a lamb, and what we love is he's, uh, he was victorious like a lion. In other words, he was a lamb that acts more like a lion, and a lion that acts more like a lamb. A lamb like lion, and a lion like lamb. So let's answer two questions this morning. What so- sort of lion was he, and what sort of lamb was God? Number one this morning, what sort of lion was he? The Lion of Judah conquered because he was willing to act the part of the Lamb. He was a Lamb like Lion. Jesus, what did he do? He came into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday like a king on the way to his throne. And he went out of Jerusalem on Good Friday like a lamb on the way to slaughter. He drove out the robbers from the temple like a, lowering, like, a li- like a lion devouring his prey. So he conquered sin and death and Satan, not because he was a lion, but because he was a lamb-like lion. The lion gets the victory through the tactics of a lamb. You could use another Old Testament comparison to show this exact thing. Sam- Samson, he was incredibly uh, strong and he was able to conquer his enemies, but what did he do in his final hour? He was, sit, he was strapped up in the temple. He was being mocked. But what happened? He surrendered his life completely to God, and this lion of a man surrendered and laid down his life, and in that moment, he was able to conquer more enemies than in his entire life. It's when we surrender to God. And so it is with Christ, the Lion of Judah has conquered. Hebrews 2.14, since therefore the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise partook on the same things, that through death, through his death, he might destroy. Isn't it incredible when you think about it? The Lamb of God, through his death, it was through his death, he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is the devil, and deliver all those through fear of death were subject to lifelong slavery. He did this when he took on the role of a lamb and died. You see, when we go low, we win. When we feel like lashing out at someone and instead just decide to be gentle in the situation, God works through us as a witness. When dealing with a difficult relationship where someone slanders us or attacks us or just flat out drives you crazy, you will need to be a reflection of Christ as a lamb-like lion, a lion-like lamb. 1 Peter 3, 14 through 16 says this, but even if you should suffer for righteousness' sake, you will be blessed. I love that. What a promise from God. What an incredible promise from God. But even if you should suffer for righteousness' sake, you will be blessed. Have no fear of them, nor be troubled, but in your heart honor Christ. The Lord is holy, always being prepared to make a difference to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. Yet do it with gentleness. Say gentleness. Do it with gentleness and respect, having a good conscience, so that when you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ may be put to shame. How can we be more like the lamb 
like lion in our relationships, we must listen to the Holy Spirit who gives us the fruit of gentleness. It's available when we are walking in the Spirit. So like Christ, we must be a lamb like lion. Also like Christ, we must be a lion like lamb, which leads me to point number two this morning. What sort of lamb was he? What sort of lamb was Jesus? As we've already said, he's a lion like lamb. Jesus was a lion like lamb. Let's go back to Revelation 5, 6. And between the throne and the four living creatures and among the elders, I saw a lamb standing as though he had been slain. Now watch this part right here. With seven horns. I want you to notice that. With seven horns. So two things here. He was once the lion. Now he's standing as a lamb who was slain. This is not an ordinary lamb. He has seven horns. What do the seven horns stand for? Well, horns is a symbol, symbol of strength throughout the book of Revelation, throughout the Old Testament. Also, the number seven represents fullness and completion. Do you see the incredible thing about this, the symbol of his crown of, that he's wearing in this moment of seven horns? So this is no ordinary lamb. He's a lion-like lamb. Now look at Revelation 6.16 where men, where men call to the mountains of rocks. And he says this, says this, Follow us and hide us from the face of him who is seated on the throne and from the la- wrath of the lamb. The wrath of a lamb. And look at Revelation 17, 14, where the final enemies of God fight against Christ. They will make war on the lamb and the lamb will conquer them for he is the Lord of lords and the king of kings. In other words, he is a lion like lamb and he will conquer in that final battle by being a lion like lamb. And in this time and in this season which we live, we have to be people who understand, who have the many facets and walk in the many facets of God's character to have the fruit of gentleness activating and working in our life because when we are encountering situations and things are happening in our life, we have to begin to lean into the spirit of God, resist what the flesh is trying to tell us and say, man, I'm going to be gentle like God right now. And how is he gentle? He is is gentle like boldness and bold like gentleness. May we be a people who stand up for what is right, but does it in love does it in gentleness because the world is watching and they need the people of God to begin to take the rightful place and begin to understand the power of God that's within them. And you might say to yourself right now, man, everything is too hard. Everything is difficult. But listen, through the spirit of God that lives within you, nothing is too impossible for God. You can stand up for what is right. You can do what's right. You can overcome what is happening inside of you. And you can listen to the spirit of God that lives within you to walk in this gentle, like boldness, and this bold, like gentleness, and have the love of Christ within you. God, give us your love and give your people your love, Father. We need it, church, so desperately. It is the only way. As we, as we think about gentleness, I think to myself, man, gentleness, I don't really like walking in gentleness. It's, it's such a humble, low place. But Christ, what did he have to do as the lion? Man, he came in victoriously, but then he laid down his life. He came in on Palm Sunday, and then he left on Good Friday, sacrificing his life for us. And he's called us to be his hands and his feet to this world. How can we really be his hands and his feet when we walk in so much bitterness? We walk in so much turmoil, when we allow everything else in our lives to turn us to the right and to the left. And it's just like, oh, Lord, let me just fix my eyes on you. It is impossible, church, to walk in the fruit of the Spirit if you don't spend time with Jesus. It is absolutely impossible. We cannot be the hands and feet of Jesus if we are not spending time with the one that we supposedly love. Because all we do then is we're acting out of religion. We're just acting out of ourselves and going through the motions. May God... Give us the grace 
to be connected to the vine, connected to him that will allow us to walk in all the fruit. The fruit is easily attainable when you're close to the Lord. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. Would you rise with me? Would you bow your heads and close your eyes? Spirit of God, we thank you that you're here. You're moving and you're speaking and you're operating, God. I pray that every heart would just be yielded to you. We're right now in this moment. Or there's things that we can all gather that are maybe different for each person from this word this morning, God. Lord, I pray that you would reveal in every single heart as they surrender to you right now for what you want to speak and what you want to say to them personally, Lord. We want to walk in the fruit of gentleness, God. So give us the grace to do that. I pray you'd speak to every person in this room right now, Jesus. Let me conclude by stressing this. I want to stress the point because Jesus was a lamb like lion and a lion like lamb. He was then found worthy to take the scroll and open its seals and bring this world to an end, which he will one day. Why? For the glory of his name and for the good of every single person who is called on his wonderful, incredible, life-saving name. And I pray that every single person in this room is part of that number. If you trust him as your lamb and submit to him as a lion, and you join the four living creatures and the 24 elders and the millions of angels to worship the King of Kings with all your heart. Maybe this morning you said, I've never made that choice to follow this gentle lion in this victorious, bold lamb, never made a choice to follow Jesus, to worship him with my life. Or maybe in this room, you just need to rededicate your life to Christ this morning. If that is you and you wanna make a decision to follow the Lord this morning, would you raise your hand? Anyone in this room?